so glad you joined me this morning to our series that we're doing here on the armor of God. And um, hope you're all keeping well. Hope you're all keeping safe in this current climate. And uh, as good and all as this is, in that we're able to do this now. I'm so looking forward to when we get back to the faith center. And I'm hoping that many of you that maybe didn't get to be or join us at the faith center will, when we get back to, when we get out from under this um, shelter in place um, and we get back to doing what we do best. Uh, that's just having that meeting where we can ask questions and, uh, you know, transact ideas and thoughts uh, together as we discuss the, the thing. But anyway, I hope you'll join us uh, in the Faith Centre when we do get back to it in the not too distant future, Lord willing. Um, again, if you've joined me this morning, please take uh, the opportunity, if you would, to let me know you're on. Please take the opportunity to uh, make any comments that you need to make or ask any questions that you would desire to ask concerning the subjects and the topics that we are talking about. We started um, several weeks ago to talk about um, the armor of God. It's a very essential uh, understanding that the body of Christ absolutely need. Uh, the scripture is going to inform us, Paul by the Spirit is going to tell us that without putting on the whole armor of God, we won't be able to stand against uh, the devices, the systematic methodical attacks of the devil. And it's essential that we know what it's for, and we, it's essential that we know why it's for. Now, I made the statement to you, I believe it was last week, and that is, um, if, you, if you try to have a discipline without a purpose, that discipline becomes monotonous and boring, like learning the piano. Uh, if, if you have a discipline to try and learn a piano, but you've got no purpose in learning it, you don't want to do it after a while. And then I also said that if you have a purpose, but you don't have a discipline to it, you'll never achieve that purpose. You've got to have both of them. And it's not sufficient to just open the Bible and read, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against. Yeah. And, and then think that, you know, well, that's something I need to do. If, if you don't have a purpose for doing it, you probably never will. Um, so we need to understand what that's all about, why we need to put it on. So in order to get to there, and we're not there yet, but in order to get to there, we had to understand some other things. So this is where we are. We're on the fourth um, session of this series on putting on the whole armor of God. We made this uh, discussion, made this awareness over the last few weeks, and that is this, that you and I as human beings are born into two worlds, so to speak. We're alive to two worlds. We've been made in the image and after the likeness of God, therefore we're spiritual, but we were put into a body, as the Bible says in Genesis 2-7, that God formed man out of the dust of the ground. So he gave man a physical body, but he put a, 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 an eternal spirit into that body and give that human the mandate to look after the earth, the planet earth, and that was the reason for our physical body, so we could, through physical means, reach and rule the physical earth in which we've been given stewardship of. Thing about it is we are, we are aware of two worlds. We're spiritual and we're physical. Unlike the other creatures that are on the planet or that were made, they're all physical, but they're not spiritual. We're spiritual and we are physical. And, and so we have access to two worlds, um, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, and many times, you know, people who are maybe not unaware or are unaware of their spirituality, what we do is we spend life thinking that we're physical beings trying to have a spiritual experience. We think there's something else out there, there's something bigger out there, and we're aware of it. So we don't know how to get to it or what it is predominantly we don't know what it is maybe and and so we use all sorts of means and methods to try and reach out to that spiritual experience and so many times our optic is we see ourselves as physical beings trying to have a spiritual experience when the reality of it is we are spirit beings having a physical experience but due to sin we became dull in our understanding and unaware of that but we are connected to two worlds, spiritual, physical. One is supernatural, one is natural, one is eternal, and one is temporal. The thing about them is these two worlds run parallel together. These two worlds coexist together. The spirit world, although you can't see it, is real. 
Uh, it's optic in the spiritual sense is very real. It's very tangible in the spirit world. It's very tangible where God is, it lives. It's, it's God's domain. And it was out of that arena, it was out of the spirit arena, which is eternal, that God spoke into existence, this physical one. This one here, the physical one, it's temporal. It's going to pass away. But the spiritual one is eternal. And so there's an eternal concept to us, an awareness of eternal concept in us, and we are connected to these two worlds. So we're aware of it. And it's like we're living in, and there's one way I could describe it, like a matrix. If any of you saw the movie, the matrix sort of depicted this re reality of two worlds that coexisted, uh, one beside the other. Uh, and most people in one weren't aware of the other, but the people in the other were aware of both. And so we have this matrix scenario, this matrix understanding. And truly, humanity is in, a, in that matrix. We're in this physical world, in a physical body, but we're spiritual beings and aware of this other coexisting parallel world called the realm of the spirit. The thing about it is God made both of them. And um, although we are confined right now to our physical body, our physiology, and we're living in this physical world, this other world is very real, very active. In this other world around us right now, that coexists with us right now, are seraphim and cherubim and living creatures and archangel and ministering angel and ministering angels, messenger angels, sorry, fallen angels, there are demons, there are devils, there are spirits, there are thrones, there are principalities, there's powers and authorities, and there are the rulers of the darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. There's all sorts of activity going on, all sorts of creatures out there in this spiritual arena. Many times because we can't see it, we think it doesn't exist, but the truth is it does. And the thing about it is this world that we're looking at, this world here, bears influence on this world in which we live physically. And, 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 it, and it, it, it has a bearing on what's going on here in this physical world. And this is what we want to see and understand. Now, I talked about how there is a principality in, in, in this arena here, the, this, this seraphim, cherubim. There is a cherub, that, a, a, fa a fallen cherub, that has become the principality that influences this physical world in which we live. And we want to talk about that this morning. Uh, he influences this physical world that we are in this morning. Now, a lot of times, because you can't see him, um, doesn't mean he doesn't exist. Because you can't see him doesn't mean that he's not bringing influence to bear in the physical world in which we live. And so we started to talk about this in individual, this uh, prince of this world. Jesus was very aware of him. Jesus, when he came down to redeem mankind, talked about him. I'm sure the disciples were wondering, what's he talking about? But Jesus was aware of these two worlds running parallel to each other, spiritual and physical and he made mention of this entity this prince of this world we talked about this particular cherub and who he was and what he was in ezekiel 28 also in isaiah 14 we discovered that this individual this cherub was a highly ranked anointed cherub he was the highest ranking of all god's creation in that arena the highest he was beautiful is beautiful and full of wisdom and he had a stewardship obviously we believe that that stewardship was here on the earth but in his stewardship and his governance of the earth at that time long before we ever existed and um, he got puffed up he got he, he got puffed up in his pride in, he got puffed up in pride in his beauty and in his wisdom and in his governance of this order that was here on the earth and in Isaiah the 14th chapter he thought in his own heart to lead a rebellion against his creator and and try to usurp his his creator and advance himself to be like God and God said no you can't do that and and in that uh, in that sin this is where sin entered God judged it and God cast him out of heaven and threw him to the earth and uh, he became a fallen entity. His name was Lucifer, which was light bearer. He was a glorious and is a glorious creature, uh, a really bright, shining, luminous uh, uh, individual and absolutely gorgeous in his, in his look and absolutely wise. 
uh, and uh, he was called Lucifer, light bearer, but in his fall he became known as Satan, which means fallen one. And we get introduced to him in the Garden of Eden when man is put here. So obviously his, his uh, journey from Lucifer to Satan took place prior to Adam and Eve coming in the garden, Adam and Eve coming on the earth, because when Adam and Eve showed up in the garden, who showed up in the garden with them? Only this individual called Satan. Um, so already he's, he has fallen from being Lucifer to Satan. Already he has fallen from his lofty position and his stewardship of governance, which he abused and, and lost it. And, um, and here he is in his fallen condition as Satan. Um, we started to talk about um, this individual and how, he, how his demise came about, how he went from Lucifer to Satan. And we took this um, teaching up last week. People call it the gap theory. In Genesis 1, 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And we took up the, these two verses, and we discovered that when God makes everything, he makes everything beautiful. When God makes everything, he, he, he makes it perfect. He's a God who does everything decently and in order. He's a God... Uh, who is not the author of confusion. And yet the Bible tells us here, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then in verse 2 says, and the earth was. Well, actually the word there was is the word became. And the earth became without form and void. Tohu abohu, which literally means a purposeless aimlessness, a wilderness, a void, a desert. And it became that way. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And it, it, it's like the lights were turned out and the whole place was shut up. And we don't know how long of a time there was between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. There could be billions of years. You know, when science talk about the earth having an ice age and the earth being billions of years old, I believe that. I think that's absolutely true. I think when they go back to look at uh, the fossilization of dinosaurs and, and all of that uh, type of stuff, and we dig it up and say, look at that, that was here. I believe that. I believe absolutely it was, and it and it it rained. It had, um, it had existence between Genesis one and Genesis two when Lucifer ran the order that was down here on the earth, uh, through which later on he became puffed up and felt that he could exalt himself to be like God because of it. So I believe all of that stuff uh, lived at this particular time between Genesis one and Genesis two. Um, and I believe from Genesis 1, 3 on, we have the restoration of the earth and God put Adam and Eve in the restored planet. And, um, and I think that's what we're experiencing right now. That's what we have today. So, um, so we talked about this, that the earth became a, a purposeless aimlessness. And, it, and yet the Bible says this in Isaiah 45 and verse 18, For thus saith the Lord God that created the heavens and the earth, God himself that formed the earth and he made it. It says he had established it. He created it not tohu abohu. He didn't create it that way. He created it. He formed it to be inhabited. So he didn't bring it to that place of a purposeless wilderness. It became that way because of a judgment that came upon Lucifer and his rebellion and the order that Lucifer governed at that particular time. And so we find the earth in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3 when God replenishes or, or, or refurbishes the planet and puts Adam and Eve into it um, that it becomes different but Satan shows up at that particular time because he's been cast down to the earth. In Isaiah 45, sorry, in Isaiah 14, 15 it says, this is the demise of Lucifer, it says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man, or I took this up last week, is this the one that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms? Now I highlighted kingdoms and I highlighted cities because I want you to understand that at, at his demise, at his demotion, um, he, there, there was some type of order that he ran, that he governed. In Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, it talks about his skill set in his merchandising and bartering and so on and so forth. Um, 
that made it uh, that implies to us that he had some type of governance here on the earth over some type of order here in his demise it says is this the one that made the earth to tremble that did shake kingdoms and that had made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof see he made the world tohu abohu he made the world a wilderness because of what he done and god judged it that made the world a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners now the reason i brought this up is because i want you to see that this entity this this dignitary in the spiritual arena this cherub called uh, satan has governing skills he has governing experience and he ran an order here kingdoms and cities before humanity ever shared up so it's something he he has done before something he's aware of he knows how to do this he's done it before failed at it but done it nonetheless in Jeremiah 4.23, Jeremiah was reminding people who thought God wouldn't show up, God wouldn't punish them, that because punishment was delayed, God didn't exist. And he said, no, no, that's not the way it is. And then he reminds them of, of an event that happened, how the God did judge a generation one time and destroyed it because they thought it wasn't going to happen. They thought they could get away with it. And no, God is a just God. And, and here he gets a, a vision of the earth that, that was back then in the days of Lucifer. And I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Here we go. This is Tohu Abohu. He, he's looking back and he sees the earth in judgment. He sees the earth where the lights are out and there's an ice age. It's, it's, it's flooded and it's frozen, obviously. Uh, without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. Again, this is not Noah's flood, because when Noah, uh, uh, when that judgment came in Noah's day and flooded the earth, it, the sun still shone, and the moon was still in the sky, and so on and so forth, and we still um, uh, had a lot of things, and we had everything that is here today as far as the heavens and the earth is concerned. But here, it, it, when this judgment happened, the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they all trembled, and the hills moved lightly, like the whole earth was pulsating. And beheld, and lo, there was no man, so this was a time when there was none of us, and all the birds of the heavens were fled, there was, there was no life. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And after Noah's flood, he went back to planting, after Noah's flood, he went back to planting a vineyard, and whatever. so it, 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 that, that was not this judgment. This is a, a one that was before this. I beheld and know the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down. And again, as Jeremiah looks back in prophecy, as he sees this vision, he sees the world tohu abohu, he sees the world of purposeless aimlessness, and he sees the cities thereof broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So he's aware that there's a judgment that took place. That's what he's using this illustration to tell the children of Israel that God will come good on his threat to bring judgment and justice. But I want you to see that there were cities that were destroyed, that, they, that for some reason had been judged by God. In Second Peter chapter 3, Peter again alludes to this um, time period and says, for this they willingly are ignorant. And again, he's talking about people who, you know, think that God's not going to show up, that there is no God, that, that God doesn't exist because we don't see his justice or judgment in the air, so they fob it off like he doesn't really exist. And it says, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was. The world that then was, was this world in which Lucifer had governance here as he ruled out of Eden in Ezekiel 28 and, uh, and, and got puffed up and led the rebellion from there um, against God. It says, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And he's talking about that uh, social order, that order that was then, it perished, it totally perished. Now the one in, in Noah's day, that didn't perish because Noah stayed on. When, when Jeremiah says here there was no man and, and there were no birds, well that's not true for Noah's because Noah had two of every creature in the earth and of course Noah and his wife and their sons and wives were here. So there was man and there were birds and there was fruitful place. So there are two different judgments. It says here whereby the world that then was, this is 
um, Lucifer's world, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, and we're talking about the current heavens and earth, and the current heaven and earth, uh, uh, heavens and earth that we see here, is the one that was before Noah's flood and after Noah's flood. It's the same sky, same sun, same moon. It's the same world. It didn't perish. It was judged, but it didn't perish because man continued on it, animals continued on it, and so the, the heaven and the earth that is now is this one here. So whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against a, a coming day of judgment and perdition upon ungodly men. And so again, Peter here alludes to this judgment that took place in the yellow there of Lucifer's uh, world. And so again, it was a, an order, it was a, 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 it had cities, it had a structure to it, and it had kingdoms, and, and it was judged. And so Adam and Eve show up, and this entity shows up in, after his demise, after his fall. Now, so God created man in his own image. Here's man enters the scene. God replenishes the earth, and he refurbishes the earth in six literal days is when he does it. He does it in six literal days. It says, And God created man in his own image. And in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. Now, again, when he says this to Noah, and God said, bless, God blessed Noah and said unto his sons, said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. You understand what he was saying to Noah. He's saying to Noah, you know, there were people here. I, I've judged it. I've taken them off. And now that we're the far side of this flood judgment and the ark. And when you come out, I want you and your, your sons and their wives to replenish, refurbish, to repopulate the earth. Well, likewise, this same mandate was given to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. The intent here, or the thought here, or the awareness here is that it used to be populated. There used to be something living in it. Remember, God said he didn't create it a wilderness. He created it to be inhabited. So whatever was here was destroyed. Whatever was here was judged. And, and Adam and Eve have now got a mandate to repopulate, which gives us the understanding that, that it was once populated and that... that for whatever reason, it, it it stopped. And now man had the mandate of repopulating the air. So that was the mandate given to man, and again, as I said, given to um, Noah. So this was Adam and Eve's job. In Psalm 115 and verse 15, it says, You are blessed of the Lord, which made the heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he had given to the children of men. Now we understand that. God owns it all. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The gold is his. The silver is his. The, the Everything is his. The fowl of the air, the fish of the sea. They all belong to God. When God gave Adam and Eve the stewardship, the management of the planet, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Man was given the mandate. Adam was given the, the assignment to replenish the earth, to be fruitful and cultivate the planet uh, as a steward, as a, as a manager. That was Adam's charge. Adam is in charge. Now, let me say this. That has never changed. Now, things may have changed, but the mandate of God, the intent of God, the purpose of God, the decree of God, the, the desire of God for man to, to be in charge of the earth has never changed. That's a law. And, and nobody can change that. In fact, if God wants to get involved in the world even today, he's got to do it through a man. You say, why? Because God made the laws. He said, look at until, until you're out of there, until your lease is up, man's in charge. That's why when God wants to do anything in the world, he, he uses a man to proclaim it because men have to give authority to it with words. The reason we pray is to give heaven a license to get involved in, in the earth. People don't realize that, but that's what prayer is. Prayer is humanity giving God license to be involved in the world in which we live. So that's why we pray, supplicate, intercede. We, as the ones who have authority in the earth, uh, invoke God 
and give God license to get involved because God made the rule. The earth he had given to the children of men, men he put in charge. That has not changed. Adam is in charge. Humanity is in charge of the planet. However, Satan came in, this entity in Genesis chapter 3, and he usurped Adam's authority. Now let me explain what usurp. Usurp means to take a position of power or importance illegally or by force. When you usurp something, you take the position of power or the position of importance illegally or by force. Now, remember this, Adam's in charge. But when Satan came along and, and said to Adam about the tree that he was not supposed to eat the fruit of, God said not to eat of it. And Adam and Eve listened to Satan when he came along and said, did God say, I mean, come on, you know rightly well that he knows rightly well that if you eat of this fruit that you'll, you'll be like God. They didn't realize they were like God. They were made in God's image and God's likeness. I mean, it, it was a deception. But when Adam, who's in charge, decided to disobey God, and again, man is decided to be under, and man is created to be under the influence of that arena. God, in that spirit world, was supposed to influence humanity, spirit to spirit, and, and through the human spirit was to help him and influence Adam to govern the earth. That's the way it was done. Um, it was like a colony. God, you know, when you have a colony, you put a governor in the colony and the colony is answerable to the, to the king or the queen in the, in the homeland. Well, God was, the intent was that God was going to colonize the earth and he was going to put humanity on it. And Adam was the governor and, and Adam was to govern under the influence of God. That's the way it was meant to be. However, the devil came in and convinced or deceived them or convinced them to disobey what God had said and to go independent of God. That act of independence was the entrance of sin. That act of independence was rebellion against the order uh, that God intended for man to come under the influence of God from that spiritual arena and through his human spirit influence the physical world or colonize the physical world. I remember Jesus told the disciples, if you're going to pray, here was God's intention. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth. That, that was always the way it was intended to be. But when Satan stepped in in Genesis chapter 3, he did something. He usurped. He, he stepped in, convinced Adam to go independent, and in doing so, he, Adam submitted himself to a new source of influence. Instead of God influence man's human spirit to, to influence the world physically, Satan convinced Adam to go independent, and in going independent, Adam placed himself under the influence of this fallen cherub. So he usurped authority. Satan is not in authority. Adam is in authority in the earth. That's the lease. That's what God gave to mankind to do. However, Satan usurped. Take a position of power or importance illegally or by force. Another definition is to take the place of someone in a position of power illegally or to supplant, take advantage of, or to encroach or infringe upon someone's rights. Satan, by convincing Adam to go independent, encroached, infringed, placed himself illegally, supplanted God's intent to, to influence man through man's human spirit and, and work out into the physical world, Satan, by making Adam go independent, took that position. He became the influence over Adam's spirit. And through Adam, of course, Adam's in charge. Through Adam, he started to influence how Adam 
ran the world. It was always intended that God would do that. It was always, we were designed that that was the way it was to happen. We were to be influenced in our spirit and through our human spirit, and we were to exercise that in our physical world. And so Satan usurped himself into the equation by convincing Adam to go independent of God. Adam becoming independent of God placed Adam under the influence, under this illegal authority, under this infringement, this encroachment of Satan's influence over man's human spirit. Man came under the influence of sin. Now, here's a rule. Whoever you yield to is your master. This, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a spiritual rule. Paul wrote this in the book of Romans by the Spirit of God. He says, do you not know, do you not understand that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are the slaves uh, of the one whom you obey. Whoever you bow your knee to becomes your master, either of sin, so if you bow your knee to sin, sin becomes your master. If you bow your knee to sin, you become the slave of it dominated, domineered, influenced by it. Either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads on to righteousness. And Paul was, was, was defining something. And here's what he was saying. Do you not understand that whoever you bow your knee to is your master? Whoever you bow your knee to, yield to, <coughs> succumb to, is the one that has the influence that bears influence on your life. And this is what happened to Adam here. The devil usurped his influence over Adam. Adam was now being influenced by the spirit world, but it wasn't by God. Adam's spirit was being now influenced by Satan, who usurped, worked, wangled his way in, usurped it, and Adam, by, by obeying, Adam by bowing, Adam by yielding to Satan, made Satan his master. So Adam became a slave of sin. Again, do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as an obedient slave, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey? So Adam came under the influence, not of God, but at the fall, Adam came under the influence of Satan. Now, who's in charge? Adam. Who rules the planet in, 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 in its current lease hold? Adam, humanity. But who's influencing humanity to set up the order that's in it? It was intended to be God. Again, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Jesus said, if you're going to pray, that was always the will of God. That was always the plan of God. And it hasn't changed. But if, if Jesus said to to the disciples, this is how you pray. Pray for God's kingdom to come. It's obvious that God's kingdom hadn't, or God's influence hadn't thoroughly been brought to bear in the earth because it's still something that, that, is, that the earth is waiting for. When the Bible talks in the book of Isaiah, unto us a son is born, unto us a child, a child is given. And when it talks about that, it talks about that the governments shall be upon his shoulders. And again, this is the desire of God that Jesus will come and set up what we call the millennial kingdom, where he will bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. So it's not here yet. So who set this place up? Man did, but under whose influence? Matthew 10, 24. Jesus is teaching here. The disciple is not above the master, nor the servant above his Lord. In other words, the destiny of the master is the destiny of the servant. They're connected. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple to, that, sorry, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, or, or the devil, how much more shall they call them of his household? In other words, whatever the master's destiny is, that's the destiny of the servant. Whatever the Lord's 
whoever the, the Lord is, the servant uh, is also subject to the same. See, a lot of people often think, why did God not, when, when Adam fell, when Satan usurped that authority and sin entered into the world, according to Romans 5, 13, and when that happened, why didn't God just take Satan and annihilate him? I mean, just put him out of existence. Well, whatever happens to the master happens to the servant. And so if he was to get rid of Satan at that juncture, Adam and Eve would have to go too. And, and God didn't want to do that. God knew what he created in Adam and Eve and, and he knew the potential that was in, in his new creation made in God's image and after God's life. There was nothing like it ever. And so God said, no, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to destroy my intent, my purpose, my plan because of this cherub, but we will sort this out. Isaiah 24, 2. It shall be as with the people, so with the priest. As with the slave, so with the master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. Principle, you're never any greater than your master. And whoever you bow your knee to, you suffer the same consequence and the same outcome that they do. So if Adam and Eve and humanity came under the influence of Satan under the slavery of sin. If, if Satan has usurped his authority of influence into the air through Adam, because Adam's still in charge, humanity's still in charge, but the influence of humanity has now become sin. Well, if God is to judge the master of sin, everybody under sin, slaves to it, all suffer the same consequence. In Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about judgment and the end times. And he says here, Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into ever or eternal fire. And watch, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not designed and never meant for humanity. Humanity was never designed, never meant to go to hell. I told you last week in, in Ezekiel 28, God brought the fire from outside of the, that iniquity that was in Satan, in Lucifer. He brought that fire out of him and created hell. Uh, every good and perfect gift comes from God, but hell came out of Satan or himself. And, and Satan was designed and to go to hell and his fallen angels are to go with him. And, and humanity was never designed to go there. And the only reason humanity would ever go to hell is because they are subject to the master that is going there. They're the servant of the lordship that is being sentenced to there. And again, the servant's never greater than the master. So if the master's going there, the servants are going there too. So the reason humanity ends up in hell is not because hell was designed for humanity. It was designed and prepared for the devil and his angels. People only go to hell because they haven't come out from under the lordship or the influence or the mastery of the devil and sin. So, Jesus was aware of all of this. When Jesus came down, he was totally aware of the matrix. He was totally aware of the two worlds. He was totally aware of God's intent and plan to bring a kingdom here. And he was totally aware that what was here was not what God intended. He had come down to deliver man from the slavery, from the bondage, from the lordship of this entity so that man could be free again. And so Jesus makes these statements. Now the judgment of this world, sorry, now is the judgment of this world, and now the prince of this world be cast out. Jesus mentioned here that there was a principality that, that, ran or governed or usurped his authority and influence into the world. And the word world there is the word cosmos, and where we get the word cosmopolitan from. Cosmos means the order or the setup or the society. Now is the judgment of this cosmos. Now shall the prince of this order be cast out. 
Jesus came down to, to deal with Satan's influence in the social order in which we call the world. In John 14, 30, Hereafter I will not speak much with you for the prince of this cosmos. And again, this is a principality. This is Satan influencing humanity because he usurped himself into that position. Who's in charge? Man. Who 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 governs the earth, man. But man's spirit is under sin and man's spirit is influenced by this principality. He's the prince of this cosmos, this social order. So he says, hereafter, I, I will not talk much with you for the prince of this social order cometh, but he had nothing in me. I'm not a part of it. In John 16, 11, it says of judgment because the prince or the principality or the influencer of this social order is judged. I came down to deal with him. Again, the people, because the disciples, because they didn't understand what was going on, they thought Jesus was coming down to deal with the Romans. He was coming down to deal with a, their the oppression that they had under Roman rule. That's not what Jesus came down to. Jesus came down to deal with the real problem, which was man's oppression, man's a, a bondage to slavery and the influence upon man of this entity called Satan. Now, it says here in, in 2 Corinthians 4.3, uh, Paul is speaking and he, he, he's looking at the big picture and he says, and if our gospel, talking about this gospel of, of salvation, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them who are lost, in whom, and then small g, in whom the God of this age, actually, the age we're living in right now, the God of this age has blinded the minds of them which believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine onto them. Our gospel is being hidden. There's an attempt to hide what we're talking about. There's an attempt to keep um, under wraps what we are doing. And the one who's doing it is the, is the principality that is governing this age we're living in, this social order that we live in. Now, who's in charge? Humanity. But the setup that you see is influenced by this external entity called Satan. It's, it's, it's been ruled and governed by sin. When people turn around and say, well, you know, why did this happen? And why is that happening? And why is there so much wickedness? And why is there so much evil? It's because man's in charge of the world and man is left a, a, to his, like Satan, the influence of Satan, pride and and the love of this uh, the love of things uh, the lust of the flesh the pride of life and and uh, well, I, I can't remember and um, the lust of the eyes the lust of uh, the world and the pride of life and these things run rampant in humanity we're all in it for ourselves well we can get out of it and so on and so forth and and it's this influence <clears throat> but we're in charge we're we're governing and, and if the world's broken, it's because we are under the wrong influence and that's why we broke it. Because we were left to ourselves. We were left to our own weaknesses. We were left to our own um, selfishness. Matthew 4. Again, the devil taketh, this is, he takes Jesus, up into a, an exceeding high mountain. And he showed him, now watch what he did. He showed him all the kingdoms of the cosmos. He just took Jesus up there, took him onto a high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms, the whole social order, <clears throat> the whole setup. Again, the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And then he said, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, he said, I'll give them to you because they were his. He was, he was the influencer of everything that, that could be seen on the world. He was the influencer of the kingdoms of this cosmos, this social order. I, I took it over to Luke, because Luke just opens a little bit better. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the cosmos, all the kingdoms of the social order, or the age that now is on the earth. 
in a moment of time. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now watch what he says. And the devil said unto him, All this power over all these kingdoms, all the power over this social order, this influence. And the devil said, All this power will I give you and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever will I, sorry, I will, I will give it. To whomsoever I will, I will give it. To whomsoever I will, I will give it. He was in charge. When I say charge, he, he, he's, he's not in charge by God's dictate, but he was influencing Adam, who was in charge, humanity who is in charge. And basically he says, you know what, this, what you see, this, what you, what you experience in, in this age, this order, it's mine. And I can give it to whoever I want. Oh, here's all I want you to do. Bow down and worship me. Bow your knee to me. Yield to me. Be, let me be your master. And I'll give it all to you. Because I know that's what you're down for. If thou will therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get behind me, Satan. I just left that in so you don't understand who, who it was that was offering him the kingdoms of the cosmos. It was Satan. He's the God of this age. He's the God of this social order that we see. He brings his influence to bear uh, uh, upon humanity as humanity takes charge of the earth. And that's where the influence comes. Again, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of them that believe least the light of the glorious gospel who is the image of God should shine on them. Now, it says here in Ephesians 6, 12, Paul speaking says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. <clears throat> Humanity is not our problem. People are not our problem. But we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this social order. This social order is influenced from this other matrix, from this other world, from this spiritual arena. And it does influence the physical world in which we live. Most people are not aware of it, but that's exactly what is happening. Jesus was aware of it, and the church need to be aware of it. And if we're going to bring influence to bear in this current age and in this current cosmos, then we've got to prepare ourselves to deal with these entities. This is what the whole armor of God is for. Ephesians 2, speaking about my past, your past, before we met Jesus, before we come out from under sin, it says, wherein in time past, you and I, all of us, walked according to the course of this social order. Watch. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You see that? You and I, we used to be under this influence. We used to walk according to the course of the social order, the setup. We were governed by it. We, we, we yielded to it. We, were, we, we had to succumb to it. We were basically caught within its system. And this system was governed or influenced according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. And if you and I are going to deal with this cosmos, going to deal with this world as born-again believers, this is the area we got to go into to bring influence. Because that's where the influence upon this world is coming from. Psalm 1. Sorry, Psalm 2, verse 1. It says, why do the heathen rage? He's talking about the nations of this cosmos, the nations of the world. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a very vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Watch, against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He said, the nations of the earth set themselves, they take a position, they counsel together and they take this position that they're not going to have anything to do with God. They, they don't want anything to do with God. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Well, who encouraged them to do that? 
Where did the influence come to oppose God come from? Well, it's the principality that influences this age that we're in, who blinds the minds of them. Least this truth comes out that you don't have to be ruled by this. You don't have to be governed by this. There's another set of laws. There's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets me free from the laws of sin and death which govern this cosmos. And so the nations of the earth under the influence of Satan oppose God. They oppose him. That's why in this world, in this cosmos, if you're going to share the gospel, you will suffer persecution. Why? Because of the influence of this other world. And and you've got to dress for this. You've got to be prepared. You can't do this in, in your own natural self. You've got to do this spiritually. It's a spiritual battle that we're taking on. In 1 John 5 it says, we know, that, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keeps himself and the wicked one, the wicked one again is Satan, this influence, this usurped authority over humanity. And the wicked one touches him not. Or there's a place as a born again believer that you can position yourself where the devil can't touch you. And this is what we're going to talk about. This is the armor of God. You're going to find a place where the wicked one can't get at you. He can't touch you. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God and uh, keepeth himself, and the wicked one touches him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole cosmos, the social order, the age in which we are living right now on the planet, the whole world lieth in wickedness. I, I, I highlighted them in green because the word wickedness is the exact same word here, the wicked one. Oh, basically what he's saying, the whole cosmos is influenced by the wicked one. There is a place, there is a place where the wicked one can touch you. There is a place you can get to where, where his influence doesn't come to bear in your life, upon your life. Because we know that the whole world is influenced by him. So he's talking to born-again believers and, and John says there is a place for born-again believers uh, and that they can be and they can find that when they get there, when they are there, they, they don't come under the influence of the wicked one because we know that the whole earth is under the influence of the wicked one, Satan. Now let me get to this in winding this down. There, as far as God's concerned, there is only three groups of people on the planet. When God looks at the planet, he only sees three groups of people. When God looks down, he sees, he doesn't look at it male or female, um, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, black or white, rich or poor, tall, short. It, that's not the way God looks at it. God, when he looks at the earth, he sees three groups of people on the planet. Paul brings it out here as the Spirit of God moves him to write this. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 32, Give none offense, neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the Church of God. Three groups of people on the planet. Three categories of people. The Jews, the Gentiles, and the Church. Jews, Gentile, Church. The Jews. Now, the Jews are a unique nation. Now, remember we read back here how that the nations of the world are opposed to God, and that's the way it has been. But God did something. God came down, and what he endeavored to do was create his own nation. So he found a guy called Abraham, and he covenanted with him. You remember that whole story? He left Ur of the Chaldees and went out and he says, I'm going to make you the father of, of, of many nations, but in particular one, your seed, I'll bless your seed. And he covenants with Abraham. And then he covenants with Abraham's son Isaac. Then he covenants with Isaac's son Jacob. And Jacob had 12 kids. And out of those 12 kids, God then covenants with his 12 kids and they form a nation called Israel. And this nation of Israel is, is one of the nations in the world, but it's different than the nations of the world. Because that, this particular nation started by faith. 
It was a nation that started by a, a, a guy, Abraham, believing God and, and covenanting with God in a blood covenant, and, and then God now bringing his influence to bear. Because when, when Abraham yielded to God by faith, God treated him as righteous, and then God started to influence Abraham's human spirit and Isaac's human spirit and Jacob's human spirit. Now, although they were still under sin, God now had, had the ability by covenant to influence and he brought about a supernatural nation. That's why Isaac was a supernatural child. That's why when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 and past having children, that God gave them this child because it was a, it was a supernatural nation birthed by covenant. So although the nations of the world are opposed to God, God came down into the world, got one guy to agree with him, and through that one guy brought forth a nation. That nation is Israel. So when God looks down at the nations of the world, he sees the Gentiles, which are all the nations of the world, the unbelieving, the, the Gentiles, but he sees among the nations of the world in this cosmos, in this age, he looks down and sees a nation that he brought about by faith, by covenant, where he could bring influence to bear through covenant because this man said, I'll yield to you, and God treated it as righteous. So when God looks down on the planet, he sees the world, he sees the order and the cosmos, he sees the Gentiles, and then he sees this nation of his own called Israel or the Jews. And he also sees another entity which is here today called the Church of God. That's, that's all God sees. Now, in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5, this is when they got delivered out of Egypt. Watch what God said. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, and again it was a covenant, this nation came about by covenant. If indeed you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be a treasured possession among all peoples. You'll, you'll be mine. Um, among all the people that are in the world, and I, and I do own everything, but, but I will have a people that, that, we, that I now have influence over. You shall be a treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a holy people, a set apart people. In this, in this order, in this age, I will have a people in the earth that I'll have influence over. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. God is speaking to Moses. So Moses came and called the elders and the people and set before them these words which God the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord had spoken, we will do. Yes, we go for it. We're in. God now had a nation over which he had influence. Now, they still had problems. They still were under sin, but through covenant and through sacrifices and whatever, and their acting of faith, whether it be in the atonement and, and so on and so forth, these acts of faith allowed God to continue to have influence over them. And God started to be able to speak into the world his intent, his purpose, and his plan, original plan for humanity, and promised that through this nation, because they were his, and because they were under his influence, by covenant and by faith, that he would bring a Messiah. And that this Messiah would come into this age, come into this cosmos, and this Messiah would fix things. But the only way God could get the Messiah in and the only way God could, could let people know what he was doing and why he was doing it and, and, and the reason for doing it was to have a people called out from the, the, the world as supernatural people of which he could covenant himself to. And he made covenants with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, with the children of Israel and with David. Told David that his, from his loins would be the Messiah. So the, this is how he got the Messiah into the world. And this, is, and this is why he did what he did, the way he did it. In Romans 2.14, it says, For the Gentiles, which have no law, 
do by nature the things that are contained in the law, this is the laws of God, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witness. For they, their thoughts, the meanwhile, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or excusing one another. Let me explain what he's saying here. As much in all as the world, humanity, which is who are in charge of the planet, are under the influence and the slavery of sin, under the influence of a spiritual entity called Satan and all of his, uh, all of his entities, man who's large and in charge, um, and under the influence of sin, man in his creation still has a thing God put in all men called a conscience. And although the world is under sin and, and all men have sinned, there's still goodness in the world. It's not all bad. Man's not bad. Man is intrinsically good. Man is intrinsically, inherently designed to be good. And man does good. And if man is allowed to, he'll be good. Until the influence of a fallen nature and the influence of these entities impose themselves upon his life or upon his weaknesses and, or upon his emotions and he starts to yield to different things. But man is intrinsically good. And so when you look around the world, as, as uh, even though it, 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 the, the devil is the god of this age and he is the, the prince of the, 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 the cosmos and the order that's set up, he still, because he's not in charge, still goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He can't devour everybody. He, he's, he's not in charge, but he is the influence. He's the master uh, spiritually over people. And man in his, in, his, in his design is intrinsically, there's goodness in him. And so man's conscience wants to do the right thing. But it's the influence of the other that keeps him in error. And so you have governments that rise up and, and, and they want to do good. They want to help humanity. They want to do the right things. And, and you say, well, where's the devil in that? Well, the devil's not in that. That's, that's that conscience that's within man, this, this right and wrong mechanism that God put in all humanity, that even though he's born a slave to sin, he still has this mechanism called the conscience that, that he knows what's right and wrong. And, 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 and that's why he's, he's guilty of his own sin, because he knows it's wrong. He, he's this inbuilt conscience that makes him aware of that. And, and man, if he's, if he's allowed to, and he's not in, overly influenced, man will intrinsically do good. He just will. He just, he, he, we do, we want to, we love to do good, we love to help, we love to contribute, we love to be a part, we love to give of ourselves. That's in all of us. But Lucifer, Satan and sin, if it's allowed to have its way and people yield to it, it it'll govern too. Make people angry and jealous and bitter and, and, and all sorts of different things. And so he's saying here that, and, and when God looks down at three groups, the, the Jews and the Gentiles and the church, the Jews, yes, he, he did what he did with the Jews for, to bring the Messiah into existence. But remember too that the whole world is not bad. People, all the people in the world are not evil people. The people in the world are good, depending on how influenced they are by the principality that governs the system. I wrote these three verses in here as we wind this down. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? So the Jews think, well, you know, God looks down and we're a supernatural nation in the cosmos. We're special. But he says much everywhere. Chiefly, here's the reason the Jews are special, because that all to them were committed the oracles of God. The whole plan of God was revealed through the Jews and they had the stewardship of writing it all down and walking with God through it to enable God's plan to happen. That is the privilege that they have. But that's it. What then? Are we better than them? That's what Paul is the argument he's bringing to the, to the Jewish nation. Are we better than them? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jew and Gentile, that we're still all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So whether we be a, a, a Jew or a Gentile, 
Although God did use the Jews, he brought that nation about for the purpose of bringing his influence to bear upon humanity so he could bring into existence his plan and purpose to fix it by bringing in the Messiah and, and through these people called the Jews, giving them the word of God so that they'd understand what God was doing in the world. But when God looks down at the Jews and the Gentiles, they're still all sinners. He knows that. They were all born under sin because of Adam. Enter the church. That's what we're all about. That's where we come into the equation. That's where we get involved. Everybody sins, Jews and Gentiles. The whole world is under that influence. God, of course, used the Jews for his influence because of covenant. But ultimately, we still are all sinners. And they all need it fixed because of Adam. That's why Jesus came. That's why we're here. And this is what it's all about. So we, the church, are a unique entity. We're a unique body in the earth. And when God looks down, he now has influence in the earth. Not like he did with the Jews, where they were still sinners under sin, and yet only through covenant and him treating them as righteous, he, he could bring his influence to bear and as long as they kept responding to him in faith they could walk this thing down the, the, down through time but they still needed saved because they were still influenced by Adam and sin that entered in they still needed the problem fixed but for the first time now God has a body in the earth that are not slaves to sin we are righteous we are treated just as if I'd never sinned we're holy, we're set apart, we're indwelt by the Spirit of God himself. We have the mind of Christ himself. We have the authority of Christ who is now raised from the dead, resurrected, seated far above all of these entities, principalities, powers, might and, and dominions, all of this other matrix. Jesus is far above it. He says, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then he give that authority to the church. So this is where the church come into the equation. God, for the first time, has an entity in this age, in this order, cosmos, that are his, totally his, that are directly under his influence, that are directly connected to God himself with his authority, with his understanding, with his revelation. That's why the Bible tells us to love not the world and that love not the order, but we do love the people in it. Our job is not to change the cosmos. Jesus will do that. Jesus is coming in the millennial kingdom to sort that out. Our job is not to, um, to fix the cosmos. Our job is to go into it and reveal the kingdom of God. Reveal that the kingdom of God is here. It's in me, it's in you, it's in us. And um, for us to get caught up in, for us to lift our view only no higher than the world that we're living in and just live according to its 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 remit, its, its order. Um, we're living far below what God had intended for us and the mission that God has given to us, the church. So we're going to bring this up next week. Uh, I hope that made sense to you. It's a lot to think about, but I just wanted to take us, so to speak, down, stroll down through time to understand what's going on and to understand our part in what's going on right now. And so that's what we're going to take up next week, this entity called the church and how we're to engage this world and the other world and we're to bring the influence of God to bear into this world. And... Uh, it's a powerful way of doing it, putting on the whole armor of God. Again, thank you for being with us. Uh, please, before you sign off, would you just say hello or make a comment or ask a question? Um, and we look forward to uh, joining with you next Saturday if you can make it. And if you can make Tuesday morning or Thursday evening for our other two series, uh, please do it. Let me just pray for you and we close. Father, I thank you for all that are listening, all that are watching on. Thank you for all that maybe you've drawn to providentially to this particular series and the, the 
by the, these words and by this particular ministry, you're helping people to understand what's going on because it's imperative that we do, particularly in the hour in which we live. Lord, give us the understanding. Illuminate us, Lord God, with the revelation of who we are as the church of God, the body of Christ, and enable and empower us, Lord, to be and do what you've meant to be and do through us in our generation, to our generation, in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you for being with me. look forward to ministering to those of you who can join me on Tuesday morning.